missed opportunity You could have come to me I'm running in your race Not trying to slow your pace We share a common goal We share a similar soul I am available Just want to let you to pass me by You want your story told Why search outside the phone You may think shiny things Build up your energy When it's this piece of coal That holds a brilliant soul If you need something new Can't share your Say the word And welcome to tonight's presentation of Shapeshifters leaders who are remixing history. My name is Regina Taylor. Tonight's webinar is presented as one of a series of events representing the Black Album Mixtape that I've created in partnership with SMU. In response to the historical significance of 2020 defined by COVID-19 and social protest, the Black Album Mixtape invites students, professionals, and the community in the arts, technology, science, and activism to share original content through May 3rd, 2021. I hope you will consider making your voice heard through this project by sharing an original piece of work in a medium of your choosing that answers questions and explores the issues that affect us today. Works can include video, music, audio, images, monologues, photos, designs, texts, interviews, or self-interviews. To recognize and celebrate the talent and work of collaborators, the Black Album Mixtape will offer eight cash awards at a virtual block party on May 11, 2021. More details on how to share your work will be forthcoming via email. Now, while you're here, a special conversation between leaders and creators who are remixing and reclaiming history through their work. This presentation will last about 40 minutes with another 10 minutes allotted for questions. As you listen in, feel free to type any questions for our speakers into the Q&A feature below. The chat feature will be used for updates and announcements by our team throughout the program. I'm pleased now to introduce our speakers. Diane McIntyre is a dancer, choreographer, director, and historical researcher who established her dance music company Sounds in Motion in 1972. Her theater choreography has appeared on Broadway, London's West End, and over 40 regional theaters. Her screen choreography includes Beloved and Miss Evers Boys, which received an Emmy Award nomination. Carl Hancock Rux is a poet, playwright, novelist, essayist, actor, director, and singer-songwriter. He is the author of several books, including the Obie Award-winning play, Talk, and a frequent collaborator in the field of dance, theater, film, and contemporary art. Mr. Rux is also co-artistic director of Mabu Minds. Octavio Solis is the author of over 20 plays, including Mother Road, Quixote Nuevo, and Hole in the Sky. His imaginative and ever-evolving work as a playwright and director continues to cross cultural and aesthetic boundaries, solidifying him as one of the great playwrights of our time. Che Yu is a playwright, Obie Award-winning director, and served as the artistic director of Victory Gardens in Chicago from 2011 to 2020. His plays have been produced at London's Royal Court Theatre and the Mark Taper Forum. 
His directing credits include the Public Theater, Playwrights Horizons, and the Humana Festival. Tonight's moderator, Nicole Salter, is an Obie Award-winning actress, writer, and chair of the board of the Theater Communications Group. She co-authored and co-performed the Pulitzer-nominated play In the Continuum. As an actress, she will soon return to Huntington Theater. As a dramatist, she is working on a commission for Woolly Mammoth Theater Company. I'm delighted to welcome our panelists and to invite Ms. Salter to lead this discussion. Hello, Ms. Taylor. Thank you so much for those wonderful introductions. I'm inspired to be here, to be among these great luminaries who represent um, a body of contribution to our field and to uh, the artistic output of America that is quite phenomenal. But today we are very interested in hearing um, why they consider themselves, or if they consider themselves, uh, artistic shapeshifters. Carl, I'll toss that question to you. Given the number of, of slashes that you and all of our panelists have in terms of their contributions, how have you um, shapeshifted and remixed your own artistic practice over the years? It's funny because I'm, I often talk about this, I guess, uh, being categorized as a multi-hyphenate. Um, I started out as a playwright and, uh, and somehow that, and being and somehow, and, and knowing that I wanted to be a writer, I think that my shape shifting throughout my career has been, is rooted in my education, which is really too long to get into. But, um, you know, I was trained in music and I was trained in theater and I was trained in, the literary arts, and I was, um, and I, I was adopted by uh, two people who had been born in Harlem. One who was born in 1915, and his wife was born in 1923. So they were generations ahead of me, and they'd seen some of the greatest musical artists and theater artists um, within the African American move that I could possibly think of within the 20th century, and they were also amazing teachers for me. So um, I think my shape shifting is a result of them and as a result of my education. Um, it is about uh, not being afraid, not being afraid of dance, not being afraid of uh, theater, not being afraid of acting, not being afraid of writing, but knowing that really at the core of who I am, what I am is a writer. Ms. McIntyre. How might you describe yourself as a shape shifter in the field? Well, I will answer the question as Carl did, because first you ask how do we find ourselves shifting in our own careers? Mm -hmm. um, in that way, I started out, of course, as a dancer. I always loved choreographing from my childhood. <laughs> I choreographed the neighborhood children. Then my focus was mainly dance. When I came to New York, I was very much associated with dance and music merging together with my company called Sounds in Motion. The thing is, I had the good fortune also to be invited to work in theater productions as a choreographer, first with the Negro Ensemble Company and the great Douglas Turner Ward, and then with Ntozaki Shange, and many amazing directors I had, including <laughs> Regina Taylor, I had the wonderful good fortune to work with over many years. And then I started becoming a little bit jealous of theater because in the modern dance, contemporary dance, we would work for a year or two or whatever. And then we would perform locally for four days, okay. I, and we would tour, but I loved in theater, you got to uh, be on the uh, at least three weeks or four months or a whole year. I'm like, whoa, let me try that. But I also get, got so many inspirations from working with amazing directors, Irene Lewis, Des Mackinac, so many amazing, uh, Oz Scott, so many directors that I wanted also to create my own works. 
So I started interviewing individuals, not being calling myself a playwright. However, because I have a lot of interest in history and people's stories, I started interviewing people and developing theater works, which I call dance driven dramas, where these works are choreographed, the text is the words of the actual people, and then that became, becomes a form, which I call dance driven drama. And I have a couple of those, which I will speak about later. One, all stories of my father and another called Open the Door, Virginia, about early 1950s civil rights events in Virginia. We will definitely be getting to hear about all of those historical narratives. Don't worry, I have them on my list of things <laughs> to talk about. But I want to delve into the same question for you, Mr. Yu. Um, how do you see yourself as the shape shifter in your artistic practice and in the development of your career? Well, I think um, being an artist, um, one has to respond I, um, most profoundly to what's around you. And I think I'm very shaped by the current events and the events that um, have befallen upon my community and how we basically continue to redefine them. In other words, um, Asians and the, and the theater is actually not a good mix because our parents have always said, you know, the arts are not meant for you. Please do something practical. So when some of us decided not to do that and to rebel, I think basically in part is understanding the American part of being Asian American. Uh, what is our expression? And more than that, how do we become more of a culture whose history and I would say sociology is known to all of us of a community. I would say my citizenship as Asian American is basically based on everything I've experienced in the American theater and not in classrooms because mm -hmm. it was never taught. So for that reason, I gravitate towards a theater and started out as an actor only to realize I don't like learning lines. Then from then in the theater, I start saying, oh, maybe I can write something and someone threw me some money to write something and I realized I could write that. And then through that, basically discovering who I was through history, again, through cultures, which I do not know anything about, which is unfortunate. And a brief aside, the current wave of anti-Asian violence is partially based on that. We don't even know our history because as a result of that, we keep quiet. We have not spoken up and theater was one way for us to do that. And when I realized theater could bring people together I started directing and then ultimately producing because I believe the American narrative is not one color. It's full of vibrant colors and communities that make this a wonderful country. We have to reclaim the American narrative deeply and through different forms, you know, from dance, which is so brilliant to hear, from playwriting, from performance to everything else. The more our narratives are being told, the more we are visible and the more I think everyone can understand why they are part of this brilliant country. At the moment, as we all know, the, there's no balance. So we need to rectify that. Well, <laughs> thank you for, for that, that plenary. I mean, Jay, you just took me down a deep road. We're gonna talk more and more about all of those topics, but I want to give Mr. Solis an opportunity to respond to the question at hand about how he sees himself as a shapeshifter in the art and how he has shapeshifted through the art. Well, thank you for having me on, uh, Ms. Salter. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I started out as an actor too, and, uh, and I went through seven years of college during doing all that, um, grad school, everything. Um, and I maintained a, a career in the early days, but just barely. I found that necessity um, led me to start writing plays so I could write roles for myself. Um, and, and then of course, somebody had to direct them. So I started directing them. Um, and then the parts got smaller as I started doing more directing because I had to be on the other side of the line. And uh, so I found that I could move through all those really well. But when I got the validation from people that I was, that they liked the writing and they wanted to see more of that, I, I thought I should just uh, gravitate more to that. I, I, I could be more personal. I, I, I thought I could tell 
stories that were that, that uh, and convey emotions that were lasting because um you know as an actor i could i i i, I could in I could cry in once in a scene once. I could, if I had to, I, I could make it. I could cry once, but to do it every night, uh, that was asking too much. I just couldn't do it. And uh, so I have great esteem for actors because they 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 automatically can go there every time and and, and produce the from the wellspring of their own experience these profound emotions and. Uh, and, and so I, I became a full on playwright and that's what I did. I have found that I've been directing a little more. I direct a lot of my own work. I've been directing on a college level. Um, and now I've also been acting as a cultural consultant for film. I worked on Coco. Uh, I, they brought me back to act. I have three lines in Coco. Uh, so that was cool. Um, but uh, then I started finding that I had uh, a, another way in which I could express myself through my writing and that was through prose. I started doing some creative nonfiction. I wrote a book uh, that sold rather well called Retablos that was released in 2018. Um, I'm working on a novel. I'm just starting it right now. And uh, even as I maintain a career as a, as a playwright, um, and I doubt that I'll ever go to acting again. I just feel like there's so much more of a demand for my work as a writer. Um, and, and, I'm, and I'm feeling it, I'm getting old. Um, so I, I feel like I got to, um, I, got, I, I, I feel like I'm more in, in that world. But having had all that experience, having had the training as an actor, having worked as a director and, uh, and working in, in, in prose and poetry as well, I feel like I have tools to be able, that, that I can bring all that to a, a rehearsal room. And, uh, and that makes me a good collaborator with directors in, in the space. Yeah, it seems to me that the shape shifting described by all four of you has um, both internal and external qualities. Things that happen, you know, from your your own cultural perspective, your own households, your own education, and your response to the invisibility that you have in society, uh, the inequity you're experiencing in society, the lack of opportunity you're experiencing in your own industry that causes you to shape sh to shape shift or die, right? To move or die. When I think of uh, the artist's role, using artists as the as a broad term, be, beyond the 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 theater, beyond um, dance, beyond architecture, like all encompassing those who craft the experience. I'll leave it at that. Those who craft the experience, I feel as though um, the broad underpinning of that uh, purpose is to bring consciousness to our collective evolution, right? When I think about historic narratives, where do you see them fitting in bringing consciousness to an evolution yet to exist? I, I, I can- Yes, <laughs> I was hoping someone would. <laughs> I was just going to say very quickly that um, that's a wonderful question and it's um, and I think that the what you said earlier within the question about um, all of us having become shapeshifters from our own cultural experiences is somewhat true and then for me in some ways, not entirely true. Um, you know, it, it, it's also about having to step outside of my culture and having to step outside of this country for the first time. It, for me, it was about going to, you know, the American University of Paris and then going to the University of Ghana and really going to the University of Ghana because, you know, I'd read that Malcolm X had gone there and I'd read that, I'd read that Maya Angelou was there and. And I, I just thought, hey, that must be a great, you know, I was 20 years old. I figured, hey, this, I, I gotta go. I, got, I must go to the University of Ghana. But what I learned at the University of Ghana um, when I was studying comparative literature, um, what was right next door was the dance company, which is a BBM Groma. And I learned so much from that dance company about the history of 
the intercises, or rather the liminal spaces that Americans have created regarding art and, um, and what we've forgotten about artistic expression and how that they are integrated and have always been integrated and have actually been integrated even, even beyond our, our knowledge and recorded time. Um, so the, that dance company, I think, created works that were always aiming at elevating everyone's consciousness, whether it was about you know, the elections that were going on in Ghana or um, you know, where Ghana stood within you know, uh, proximity to Nigeria or where Ghana stood uh, within Africa, the continent itself. Um, but then what was really amazing was that all of that was rooted in uh, you know, an historical practice that, that, that never differentiated one thing or the other. It never said that, you know, well, I'm an actor and I'm only an actor, or that I'm a dancer and I'm only a dancer, or I'm a singer and I'm only a singer, or I'm a writer and I'm only a writer, you know, and, or that, you know, that I'm a playwright and I'm only a playwright. You know, I mean, it's, it's a, it, was, it, was, it was a culture that was thousands of years old. And, um, and it was primarily expressed through dance, which is why I have so much respect for Miss McIntyre and people like her and other people who have actually continued to in integrate, you know, not only the process of what, you know, um, these, these various, these various and these, these various genres mean, but also how we can continue to speak to our collective consciousness in a contemporary way according to our historical understanding of who we really are. And sometimes that takes stepping outside of your culture. Yes. Uh, Mr. Solis, I saw that you also had a, a response there. Uh, yes. Uh, I, I, I believe that time is a, is a living thing and that, it, that we don't just change, have the power to change the future, that we have the power to change the past by how we react to it, by how we respond to it. Um, and so it's, um, I, I think that that is, is always, always in effect whenever we look at an event in, in history, in the past. If we ignore it, we forget about it, if we don't honor it, if we don't deal with it, wrestle with it, it's going to always just remain frozen in the way it, it has been uh, addressed before. Um, there's, there's a character who, uh, uh, in one of my plays, Mother Road, who is uh, a direct descendant of Tom Joad. The play is a kind of sequel to The Grapes of Wrath. And this character who happens to be Mexican, because I imagine that Tom Joad at the end of the novel um, fled to Mexico, married a Mexican woman, and then their children had children, their children had children, and pretty soon uh, they, come, they return to the US to work as, as, as uh, migrant workers. Um, but this young man is the descendant of Tom Joad, and he finds the tomb or, or the grave um, off the side of the road of his great, 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 great grandfather, and he digs him up. And as he's digging him up, he he asserts that that not only is 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 he an Oki because his grandfather made him an Oki, but his that that grandfather those bones are the bones of a Mexican because I make him Mexican, he says. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the, the fruit feeds the root. Um, and as much as the root feeds, feeds the, the, the fruit. And so I, I have this, this sort of in relationship with time that allows me to revisit moments in, in history. And through my experience with them as a writer, I feel like I'm changing, like I'm re remixing, revising, or just re-examining uh, or shedding light on moments in history that haven't been seen before, that haven't been addressed before. Um, so in, in that way, I feel like, like, uh, like I'm also a shapeshifter. I'm also becoming a, a, a coyote working uh, and messing with, and with the past. I hope someone's recording this because these responses are blowing me away. <laughs> um, thank you to both for that. 
I want to give uh, Ms. McIntyre, Mr. Yu, the opportunity also to, to chime in on this idea of how the past, this thing that perhaps in the American culture is often regarded as, as um, Mr. Soli said, as dead, gone, yesteryear, uh, frozen, uh, unchangeable, is actually participating in our collective evolution and how our art um, helps to um, illuminate that. Where are you guys sitting on that? Well, I'll say something about it. Because I feel when we see in theater, visual art, dance, when we, some, when we experience something that is sharing history, okay, telling us something that is based in uh, reality, in history, there's a way that it touches people's hearts and minds in a way that's more profound, well, let me not, <laughs> that touches people in a deep way in a way that would be different from them reading that history. Mm -hmm. First of all, because it's written by a playwright whose ingenuity is infused into that history mm -hmm. and something that person was really compelled to bring that history to life. Then you have the director, you have the collaborators, you have the performers bringing this energy into that history that history becomes alive in a way that is a vibrancy that's different than if you saw it in a book. Okay, what that does is that aliveness brings that aliveness to the person who's the viewer. That history becomes alive inside of them. Not just because maybe they didn't know that, Maybe they did know all of that before, but there's an, an emotional response to it. There's like, wow, that happened? Well, tomorrow I'm going to so-and-so. <laughs> tomorrow I'm going to take some action. Or maybe they don't even have that thought in their head, but something has shifted inside of that individual. Hmm. That's why I feel the the historical theater, since we're mostly speaking about theater, I think it's just vital. Well, I'd like to think of it as, as storytelling because sometimes theater in people's minds means like a proscenium or something. Mm -hmm. there, there's the grand bringing to life of story, however, yeah. however that might happen. I wanna keep that open. And I love this idea that you're presenting. The past is the present and the present is the past. Or as Mr. Solis said, the root feeds the fruit and the fruit feeds the root. Um, che, where are you at and how this historical narrative, I'm sorry, Mr. You. Oh, it's all right, call me Che. <laughs> I think it's hard to divorce history from our present lives. And I think the problem is we do not know enough of our history because it has been eradicated, it has never been recorded, it has been assumed, it has been rewritten by other people. So until we know our collective history, which is very wealthy, we begin to understand who we are and also how we relate to everyone. And I think as storytellers, there is the proverbial fire that we have to sit around. We need to have storytellers telling us about who we are, where we come from, and also from other peoples and other communities and also the power of it to imagine what that would mean um, to enlighten. For example, I remember um, when I was producing a play, um, I had commissioned Marcus Gartley, a, a black playwright, a brilliant black playwright to write a new play. And he was actually working on something. And then um, the murder of Trayvon Martin happened and he couldn't finish the play. And I said, well, we have three months. What do you want to write? He decided to write a play trying to figure out how racism really began in this country as a construct where the indentured servants and um, being the Irish and the Africans who had come together and how they actually worked together. And he found it through history. And Marcus loves history and always found a way to remix history for contemporary audiences. And from that was a great conversation that we needed to have as a country to see, ah, this is the construct. This is how we got here today. Then the question that we ask the audiences is, as artists, 
what are you going to do about this? Mm -hmm. Do you know where you come from? This is the legacy, the legacy that you didn't know, the legacy that was hidden from you. Now that you know, what can we do? And I think as storytellers, be it dance, performance, film, or the combinations thereof, it's the most potent thing. I mean, it's always a wonderful experience to go see a mindless movie or a play about something with lots of music and lights and glitter. But sometimes we just need to see ourselves, how we got here through this wonderful history. I'm, I will just finally say that I'm always um, a little grateful for the fact that a lot of people in the past had gone through a lot for all of us to walk into a room without being arrested, even though the circumstances are always very complicated these days, or the fact that people have died so that we can actually drink from the same fountain. If we do not remember that history, it will repeat. And if we do not tell the stories, someone will tell it for us and we will be defined by that. Speaking of defined by, it's a wonderful segue into my next question, Jay, which stems from the idea that the narrative itself in all of its forms of expression, be it you know, in the literary arts or the music arts or the, or the movement arts or the architectural arts are always actually um, honing in on creating meaning and becoming the organizing principle around which you can understand yourself, each other and the world in which we're in, right? So when you think about the power of the narrative in all of its forms to become the organizing principle, or as I always say, the software to the body's hardware, how do you think your works, because I really wanna hear some about your works, um, help to create or remix that organizing principle that programs us all for our collective evolution. And I'll speak specifically. I would love to hear about um, Mrs. McIntyre's production um, or about Barbara Johns. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear about Che's A Beautiful Country. <laughs> I would love to hear about Mr. Solis's uh, Treaty of Guadalupe Hildado. And I would love to hear about Carl Han Hancock Rux's, um The Baptism. But I'm also open to not getting what I want. And you talking about <laughs> whatever um, you think best responds to that impulse of how our historic narratives are becoming the, the, uh, the, the are remixed or shape-shifted uh, historic narratives are becoming the new organizing principle that hopes to plant the seed that programs the development of something, uh, a new experience on the collective scale. I sometimes wonder if we are looking for, and, and maybe, I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question, or the latter part of your question, not the first part, but I sometimes wonder if we are looking for something, a new way of entering into um, our collective consciousness, or rather even looking for a new collective consciousness mm -hmm. itself, without regarding the fact that history already abides within us. So my ability to speak to you just in language and just in sound, all I'm doing right now is I'm speaking what we call English, I'm making some sounds that you understand, and I'm making some gestures that you seem to understand. Um, uh, those things have power, those things have meaning, and they always have. Uh, for, for me, you know, the, when I, to go to what you were asking about, about uh, our specific works, when I collaborated with the uh, photographer, Carrie Mae Weems, on the baptism, well, first I was commissioned by Lincoln Center to pay tribute to John Lewis and to C.T. Vivian. And really the original, the initial uh, commission was to write a poem. And the first thing that came to mind was, I can, you know, yes, I'll, I'll take that commission. I'd be very happy to write a, a, um, 
something in tribute to these great men. I mean, I'd written many tributes that, that had been published in, in newspapers and things like that before, rather they were, whether they were poems or not, um, uh, Francis and people that had gone on, Ruby Dee and Amir Duraka, uh, so many of my heroes. Um, but this time I wanted to collaborate. This time I didn't want it to simply be the words that you know, came out of my mind you know, onto a piece of paper. Um, I wanted to allow the consciousness that I was experiencing and what it was I felt needed to be said, really needed to be said to who we are right now, while at the same time speaking to what happened then. And if you don't know who C.T. Vivian is and if you don't know who John Lewis is, they were civil rights activists, um, these men were very involved in Bloody Sunday. Um, they were uh, very involved in um, all of the all of the rights that Af and so many of the, all of the rights that African Americans actually have in this country. Um, and they were incredible men, and they died on the same day. So I I felt like being asked to pay tribute to America to to to, to civil rights his, uh, uh, historic figures. It, at a time when we're living through, you know, this Black Lives Matter movement, and while we were living through uh, this pandemic, um, made me want to relate my words to image, and to allow um, an image maker, I guess, to um, to 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 have her say, but to have her say non-verbally, and so. Um, I th and I think that there's, I think there's incredible power in the nonverbal, as well as the verbal. Um, I don't know if I'm, if I'm straying a little bit, but, but I think that you know, to, 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 to answer that, 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 that question about my, my specific work, the baptism, uh, and how this country is moving into, or not moving into a collective consciousness. My parents, and I'll say this very quickly. Sorry. <clears throat> My parents, I have to go back to my parents, They because they were my first educators. When I say my parents, I mean my adoptive parents. They had Saturday nights, and every Saturday night they um, was jazz night, and they would play, you know, Coltrane and Billie Holiday and Betty Carter, and I did not understand. I knew nothing. I knew nothing. This is generations beyond me. I didn't know anything about this music. I didn't really know anything about these people who were also generations beyond me. And they would sit, right? And they would talk to each other and they would sort of call me into the living room. And then they would talk to me about the music I was hearing. And they would say, do, like, do you hear that? I'm, in, I'm four years old, five years old. Do you hear the phrase? Do you hear the, like, what the horn is doing right now? Do you, did you hear that? Do you, what does that mean? Do you hear what that means? What, what does that mean? In that, in that way, they were, they were themselves musicologists, but even beyond being great musicologists, um, they were great teachers and, and allowing me to, you know, listen to something that had been said before that I will need for now. Or as mm -hmm. the great Dr. Bernie Shanson Regan says, um, mm -hmm. uh, has said so many times, uh, you should learn this song because you never know when you might need it. And so I learned songs <sighs> without knowing when I would need them. And that is how we entered, that's how I entered into this. Oh my goodness. That is amazing. It just, I just brought a little tear to my eye because my mom is always talking about death. Don't, I just like, mom, please. And she's like, but I'll never die because I'll always be in your head. And when you put too much salt, I'll say, that's too much. And you'll hear me. <laughs> and, I, and I started crying and laughing and she's like, I, I hear my ancestors all the time. Well, that, those are the first words of the baptism. We never die. Right. Never die. The first words. Ah, never. Goosebumps. Goosebumps. We never die. Please keep feeding me, you wonderful people. I feel like I'm being consumptive. I should, I should offer you something first. But no, just keep feeding me. Feed me. I'm, I'm just... I'm, I'm limited. I know I'm limited in time. I'm supposed to stop and take other people's questions, but I have my own questions. So let me, let me just respond to the audience because I, I do want to engage. Um, hello, Joan. 
Um, says, I'm appreciating this beautiful and generous conversation, speaking of the great John Lewis. What are the thoughts of the panelists about the need or perhaps the responsibility of the artists to be involved in direct civic actions like protecting voting rights that are severely under attack? What say you about, and I wanted to bring that up aside um, from the comments that were just being made, this idea of, of the responsibility of the artist. So the artist has the power, the power to reflect and the power to project their influence over those whose uh, attention they have captured. But what requisite responsibility comes with those privileges as they were? Well, uh, we have the tool um, that we should use, our art. Uh, that's the best tool. I mean, it's, it's so easy to just, you know, give $5, $10, whatever you wanna give to those causes when you get that email uh, and, and feel like you've allayed your conscience uh, and you've done enough because you, we still can't get out. We, you know, especially where I live in uh, rural Oregon, I can't go to those major cities to be directly involved in, in protests or in, and be active in that way. But I have this other tool and it's my art. And, and when I devote my art to, that, to those causes, to highlighting those, uh, those inequalities, those inequities, the injustice, then I feel like I'm using what's best of, about me uh, for that for that way. But I don't want to be I don't want to be uh, a pamphlet. I, I don't think uh, I want to be reduced. I want to reduce my, my art to a pamphlet. It has to be complicated. It isn't simple. It's it's not that simple. It is uh, wrought with a lot of complex issues, and I want and I look for those complications all the time because I don't want to be facile and audiences don't like to be preached at. So we have to do it in a way, we have to use our art in a way that it doesn't feel like a cudgel until it needs to be a cudgel. Um, and I felt like when I was writing Quixote Nuevo that, uh, that there was just, there were too many people out there saying things about uh, illegal aliens, quote unquote, illegal aliens, uh, the undocumented, and uh, that it led to um, a massacre in Walmart in my hometown of El Paso. And I said, you know, excuse the language, fuck it. I'm going to say what I need to say in this play about Trump and about the language that he uses and uh, that, is, uh, that is making, that is causing people to hate my people. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to be directly political here in this situation because I have that power in my, uh, it, I have that platform. I can use it in this way. I don't like to always use it like this, but sometimes it, you have to, you have to stand up and take a stand because they're taking a stand and, in, and it's causing death and hatred and division. And so I have to take a stand against that uh, quite deliberately in, in, in some of my work. Um, I have a new play that I'm working on. You mentioned the Treaty of uh, Guadalupe Hidalgo where I, uh, I'm writing this for the arena stage. It's a history play. I'm going back to 1848 when they signed the treaty that made the Rio Grande, in Texas anyway, the border and, uh, and, and made Texas officially a state of the union. Um, and, um, and, but it's not about the treaty. It's about the people that were affected who lived on the other side of the river and were formerly Mexicans, uh, and then suddenly became American citizens with all the rights thereunto delivered to them, at least on paper. Um, but that's not how it turned out. They were scared off the land. They were they were they were um, chased off the land. They were murdered. Uh, they found people found every way to kind of uh, take the land that uh, these formerly Mexican citizens had. And drove them away, or just simply just just found ways to have them disinherit this this land. So I'm telling that story, um, and dealing with um, the savage. What what one? Uh, I wish I could remember his name. A great African poet who 
referred to the savagery of monuments. And Texas has a lot of those that are very sacred to them. Um, monuments like the Alamo, monuments like the, Amer like, like the Texas flag, monuments that they hold against and over Mexicans, monuments like the Texas Rangers that they have held over Mexicans for many years. Uh, and all it was for a long time was a glorified enforcement arm of bigots who wanted to uh, drive Mexicans away from Texas. And I take a look, a good hard look at that and show it up for what it was, because that's not what we're taught in history books at all. And I grew up in Texas and that was, I took Texas history, but there was a Texas history that was missing. Uh, and it was for people uh, of Mexican descent. Um, and uh, it doesn't matter that times are different. It doesn't matter how well regarded the Texas Rangers are now. We have to look at that history of how they treated us before and show it, show it yeah. back to them so that we can then learn from that. That recalibration happening. Absolutely. We just have a few minutes left and I wanna make sure I hear from Ms. McIntyre, Mr. Yu about this question of the responsibility of our works and how the work that you're already creating um, meets that responsibility or if you feel that responsibility at all in your, in your creative process. I think picking up on your metaphor, um, Nicole and Carl, if you've got a voice, sing it. That's your gift and that's your responsibility. If you do not sing, you do not scream, you do not shout, you do not rejoice, it's silence. And in this country, uh, we are one of the few lucky ones, even though it's kind of murky, we do have the freedom of speech. In many other countries, you don't. So when we start saying things that we wanted to say on stage, on, in the dance, in music, some people get arrested or killed. So right now, we have to keep singing and screaming, especially about injustices. And the beauty of what we do best is to tell stories. And stories, like you say much earlier before, they cling to the heart. You feel, and hopefully it haunts you for you to actually create some kind of dialogue with yourself or with other people and hopefully towards action. And I think my only hope is when we start screaming or we become, which I do kind of love being an old fashioned um, notion that we are poets of the community. We are speaking for the community. We are representing the community. So what are we saying? Mm -hmm. And not only must we speak to our community, we must bring those stories to communities who hate us, who do not listen to us, who dehumanize us. How do we bring these plays, these dances, these songs to those people? Because right now we are just singing to the converted and it's middle-class and it's very opaque. And we, have, we do not have enough access for even our community co to go to a theater, to afford to go to the theater. So we have some systemic problems that we need to figure out how to make sure that we again become the fireplace where everyone can gather to listen. We can't even sit together in the theater anymore for the last five years. Mm. I mean, you know, last 10 years ago, you could sit next to someone who you may not believe in politically, mm -hmm. but we breathe together in that space. Mm. How do we breathe again, collectively through the artist's voice? So our voice is to gather, is to remind, is to celebrate. It's also to criticize and provoke action, towards a more socially just society. I'll end by saying it's sad that we're still doing Trojan women. That was from Greece thousands of years ago because the subjugation of women, the torture of women and war has never been resolved. And it would be kind of great to have one of my plays or some of our friends plays be redundant. They're not because the living documents of a humanity that needs to change. So we have to scream louder and sing louder. Yeah, I mean, we definitely live in a culture where conflict seems to be the driver for change and yet things remain the same. It's interesting that we're at this place, this shape-shifting place where, where change can come from choice, perhaps. I wish I could clap too, absolutely. Um, I would love for Ms. McIntyre to respond to that question. 
Yes. But also there's a question in the chat from Ms. McIntyre about what you're currently working on. Mm -hmm. If you could if you could bring both of those questions to the <laughs> to the fore in your response, you'd make everybody very happy. Okay. All right. So let me uh, answer the first question first. Because when I was a child, I was not dancing in order to make a change in society. I was dancing because I love to dance. I thought it was a fabulous thing to do. I mean, it was just in me. I guess I was born dancing from when I was little. The thing is, when I was, uh, I'm a person who's a product right after the Black Arts, Black Arts Movement. So I'm surrounded by that. In the late 60s, and I come to New York in the early 70s, and everybody, I had a person, that, uh, Cheston Everett, I worked with him in, in Milwaukee. His, um, uh, so anyway, he instilled in us as black artists, he was in the, theater, in, the, in the theater department as an English person, English professor. He, inst he did productions that were all black on the side, so to speak, but for everybody. He instilled in us, the print, the prince, the instilled in us as artists. We as black artists had the call. It was our duty to help bring the consciousness of our people to our own people and to everybody in the works that we did. That just got put inside of me when I was a young person. I'm like, Wow, yes, but it wasn't hard because it was all around me, okay? And the people I worked with, it was in the music that I worked with. The music was powerful, even though the music didn't have to have words. The music was saying, move forward, open the world. We are here and we are not going anyplace. You don't even have to have a word or a lyric with it. It's just like, whoa, here we are. Sometimes one, sometimes people who saw my company back in the day said that afterwards they were a little bit afraid to see us afterwards. Uh, would we be really saying hello to white people and all like that? Because, because they thought, whoa, because we were serious. This is who we are, but we were still nice people. We were nice people too. Okay, let me move fast forward. We were nice people, but an artist, as artists, we have to scream. Even if it's the way we do a turn like that, if we fall on the floor with ah, but we usually in my pieces, we always rise up. There's nothing can stop us. Okay, so I'm working on a new piece called Speaking in the Same Tongue. And in this piece, which has some, uh, it's a music dance piece, but it also has some spoken word in it. It is about the power of language to kind of make us who we are. It will come through in dance, in movement. And um, it, it's, that's very important to me. Even the sound of a person's voice grating on you, what that does to you. Or you hear music that says, or somebody say, oh, you're nothing but a um, you're nothing but a um, you're nothing but a um. And that makes you that. Okay, so that's something I'm working on. It's gonna go on tour 2022. Octopus Theatricals is the tour management. The thing is, when I did this piece about Barbara Rose Johns, she was a young lady, uh, 16 year old in 1951. I try to say it fast. 1951, she, a cause a strike in her black school, segregated school in Farmville, Virginia. She took a stand that she would have her whole school leave the premises, go on strike for a better school. Their school was horrible and they had the most brilliant teachers. She brought in the lawyers from the NAACP. Their case became part of Brown versus Board of Education. 16 years old. After it became Brown, became the law of the land that segregation was uh, unconstitutional in public institutions, that county, Prince 
Edward County, they close the schools for five years instead of desegregate, okay? The white or black children had no place to go to school, but they opened white schools for private white schools. Okay, I made a whole piece about that. I interviewed people because it had lyrics. It's a dance driven drama. It was run, it was a theater presentation. What I put in the middle of it, so you not just saw that history, I had a young person in it from today and he sang, what am I going to school for? Why do I need school? I can make more money on the street than going to school. Da, 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 da. What I need a degree. I won that contrast between these young people back in 1951 were willing, given their lives for a better education. And now what? What about school? Oh, well, is it the educational? So that was my particular. Now I have to say that Barbara Rose Johns, there is going to be a statue erected of her in the US Capitol to replace the statue of Robert E. Lee. Mm -hmm. Better, And I hope that my work starting in 2005 put the energy out there about her. And I am just elated about that. And next Friday, April 23rd is the 70th anniversary of her walkout, of her walkout. And they're selling it, celebrating it at R.R. Moulton School and Museum in Farmville, Virginia. You can go to their uh, website. Wow. Yeah, we have a responsibility. That's my bottom line. <laughs> That's your bottom line. If you don't know, now you know that there is a responsibility, says Ms. McIntyre, and I agree. We have one more question in the Q&A, and I think it's a beautiful question to end. When we think about um, the newer generations and the children, we always think about them as a future and as um, storytellers of historic narrative. Um, how, do, how do you want to, or how are you encouraging young people to recognize their power as individuals to take back their future I can answer that very quickly for me in three parts and I'll try to make it, and I will make it very succinct. One is um, a gift. When I say a gift, I mean something that was said to me. Again, back to, and I always seem to return back to something that Dr. Bernice Shantz from Lincoln said to me, which is, there comes a time in your life when you discover an emptiness you had no thought of yourself as being empty and you've been operating as if you were not, but it's there, that emptiness. And when you discover that emptiness, nothing hurts more than that emptiness, except your yearning to be full. And that's when, for the first time in your life and for the first time with your life, you search for a tongue, a language, a means of articulation. And that's all the children really need to know. Politics, what are they, right? What, what is privilege? What, what, what do we understand? What, what don't we understand? I mean, let, if, if we understand our emptiness, if we understand what we don't have, if we understand what we need, if we understand what we want, if we, if we begin to just look around the room, or as Quincy Jones says, you know, in your life, you know, make room for the ghost. You know, always leave room for the ghost always leave room for the ghost. And no matter what you create, always leave room for the ghost. So that you are never really walking through the world saying, I know, I know, I know, I have the answer. I am, I am, I am, but I am becoming and I am trying to know and I am unearthing and I am finding and I'm seeking and I'm discovering my emptiness. And when I discover my emptiness, I start to learn something about Che's culture. I start to learn something about, um, you know, Native Americans and, and about, you know, Khalifas, you know, which, which should be, you know, uh, which we now call California, right? Um, I start to learn something about, you know, on and on, uh, uh, you know, the, the gesture of, you know, that a plie is, you know, sure, that's a European word, uh, that's a French word for um, how the leg is turned, but people are turning there. 
their, their people were using their their appendages and their their, their arms in, in in certain ways before they called it dance. You know, where's your emptiness? How do you become full? Hmm. That's what I would tell you. Well, oh. Yes, Miss McIntyre. Yeah. On uh, uh, following up with what Carl says, I was feeling that I wanted to say also that beauty, love, and gentleness in our art is also what you could be calling revolutionary. Mm. When you see a person who doesn't look like you and you see them in in an embrace with another person, you understand that love, that beauty, that compassion, it runs through that human being. That human being is a flower too. Oh my God, yes. yes. And, and I, oh my God, and I, I, I'm so, that's so, yeah, this, very quickly, real quickly, I was in my house, I was listening to Betty Carter the other day, because my mother, right? And I've never, I've never heard this particular song. Um, everybody should hear it. Um, uh, I'm Yours, You're Mine, I think that's the name of it. Um, that's the title of it. Really, she, if you know of Betty Carter, she's uh, improvising and, you know, she's, the music is playing and there are no lyrics. For eight minutes, this beautiful song that's just playing while I'm cleaning my house, right? You know, it's just eight minutes of just Betty Carter's beautiful voice. And at the end of the song, right at the eighth, around, around about the eighth minute, there's that one lyric that she says, and that's the end of the song. And the, and the lyric is, it's so nice to see you again. That was revolutionary to me. Or it, I'm sorry, it will be nice. It'll, it'll be so nice to see you again. Which, which some, somehow for me, it made me, made me think about like this, you know, this, this moment of separation that we're in, you know, who we have not seen and that, she, and that, and that you know, she sung the song and that's all she had to say. It will be so nice to see you again. You know, I mean, how powerful is that? How incredible is that? I forgot the other thing I was gonna say and that's a good thing, so. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, we have to end, I've been told, um, by the it. power. It really well. That's a, that's a beautiful, a beautiful ending. Um, and I'll just offer, you know, we all have the opportunity to write our own narratives, to define ourselves. And um, if I were to say so uh, to the young people, I would say always know where you stand in the continuum. Yeah. Um, this has been outstanding, says Rodney Hicks. Thank you all. So beautiful, enlightening, deeply moving. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all. I mean, I can't wait to be in physical space again. I'm meeting so many people who I've actually never met. It's, it's astounding to me. But I consider you all a part of my community. And I like to um, just extend the greatest gratitude for all of the contributions that you've made and for the wisdom that you've imparted here and the encouragement that you've given all of the people watching. Thank you so much. Hi, Leah. <laughs> and thank you too, Donna Stein. I'm gonna welcome back. Uh, yes, I'm going to say this. Join us Tuesday, April 27th for the next event in the series, Food for Thought, Arts, Activism, and Technology, a virtual dinner discussion. A virtual dinner discussion? Let me come back and have some dinner. Register at the link in the chat. I'll welcome back Miss Regina Taylor to take us out and to say thank you to her for assembling this amazing group of people to have this powerful conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, oh my gosh, um, that was deep and wonderful and moving. Uh, it is, I, I am so happy to be with you in this evening um, to hear your words. Uh, there is a, a revolution that happens uh, through the arts that can happen in a word and can happen in a gesture can happen 
beginning with the thought, a dream. Uh, you are shapeshifters. Uh, you have reclaimed history and made it your own through your own perspective. And I thank you. I thank you for sharing so bravely uh, your process, your thoughts with us this evening. Thank, thank you, Jane. Thank, thank you, you so much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Octavia. Thank you, uh, thank you Nicole. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Solis. Thank you, Miss Diane. And of course, thank you all for joining us this evening for this wonderful conversation. If you found yourself inspired by tonight's dialogue, <laughs> this project, consider sharing a piece of your work on the mixtape. Share your words, ignite others, inspire others. Uh, details will be forthcoming via email. Meantime, take care, be safe and be well. Thank you.